Uh, so, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the Italian launch of the report uh, The Lancet Countdown, Tracking Progress on Health and Climate Change. I'm very glad uh, to do the opening of this important event. As uh, most of you know, my name is Silvio Gualdi, uh, and I'm here. You know also because there is written here, so it's easy. And, um, and I'm here to do the honors for CMCC Foundation. And uh, since, unfortunately, uh, Professor Carlo Carraro can't be here today with us, uh, uh, I do the honors also for CMCC at uh, Ca Foscari. Uh, I don't want to, to use too much time uh, for my introduction. I don't have a real introduction, just I would like to say a few words. Uh, um, not not uh, not, ma not, not uh, many words about the CMCC Foundation since uh, um, from uh, the faces that I see in the room, I know that most of you already know CMCC. And for those that uh, uh, don't know it, uh, I just invite them to Google CMCC on the web and find all the information that uh, uh, they want. Uh, the, the only thing that uh, perhaps is uh, or relevant to say here is that uh, CMCC is a research center that has a, has a transdisciplinary approach uh, to the climate problem, uh, trying to understand uh, the physical aspects, uh, so the dynamics of uh, the climate system and the, the driver of uh, climate change from the physical point of view, but also uh, investigate, uh, CMCC wants also to investigate uh, the whole chain of uh, impacts and consequences that climate change uh, uh, has, and um, so considering the impact uh, in a number of uh, uh, different sectors uh, up to uh, the economical impact, so the evaluation of uh, the costs uh, that uh, policies uh, of uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, can have. Uh, so talking about the impacts, we all know that uh, um, Climate change is a number of different impact, impacts, as I said, but probably one of the most uh, important and relevant uh, for, for us and for our society is the impacts that climate change uh, can have on, uh, on uh, our health. Um, there are obvious impacts, uh, such as, for example, heat waves. Uh, we all know that uh, heat waves might represent serious problems for people who are affected by, for example, cardiovascular problems and uh, so this is a direct, uh, um, how to say, a direct uh, influence that climate change uh, might have on our health but uh, there are also other maybe less uh, direct uh, impacts uh, such as for example the changing in the environmental conditions that uh, could make uh, more favorable uh, the spread of uh, vector borne disease uh, such uh, um, as, for example, um, the, um, the Nile virus that uh, we all know that in the uh, past few years has become um, a, a firmly has become firmly present also in uh, in our region in Veneto and more generally in the northeastern Italy. So all these aspects are um, are considered in the report uh, that will be the presented today. And uh, also beyond this, uh, there are other important aspects such, such as, for example, the impacts that uh, climate change uh, uh, might have, uh, for example, on the quality of drinkable water and the effects that the change, and in particular the reduction of the quality of drinkable water could have on, on, uh, on, uh, on our health. Uh, or uh, the reduced uh, food availability as, as another consequence of climate change in, in some region of the world. Uh, so the uh, reduced food availability has obvious consequences on uh, malnutrition and all the impacts that uh, this could have on, uh, on the health. So for all these reason, reasons, the report uh, clearly indicates the objective of keeping the warming of our planet uh, uh, below the two centigrade as a key uh, um, as a key message of the report and uh, there is a statement uh, in uh, in the title 
of this presentation that I, I think uh, is, uh, is very appropriate. Uh, so keeping the, 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 um, the warming below uh, the two centigrade is extremely important uh, to do so that the health of uh, a child born today is not defined by a change in climate. I think that this is a very, very clear statement and very appropriate. Um, okay, so as I said, I don't want to spend too much time uh, uh, to the speakers that will follow me, so I stop here. I thank you for being here today, and I leave the floor to Shuri. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, one housekeeping issue, it is a beautiful day, but you will notice the heating system is not working, but that is due to the unprecedented aqua or flooding that we had last week, so the heating system is having issues, but please bear with us. So, now, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Manina Romanello, the data scientist at the Lancet Countdown team, to present the 2019 report of Lancet Countdown. Marina, the floor is all yours. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, okay, so hi everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, presenting the, the report for 2019 for the Lancet Countdown. We had a launch in London at an underground uh, lecture theater in Welcome Trust, and I have to say, this is a lot nicer uh, than the underground in London. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to CMCC Foundation for having us and to the University of Venice. Um, as uh, Shura just said, I'm um, data analyst for the Lancet Countdown. So just to give you a bit of an overview, um, the Lancet Countdown report is published each year at the Lancet. You must all know that the Lancet is probably the most influential biomedical um, uh, journal in the world. It's the oldest English biomedical journal. And they have been working on trying to explore the, the health effects of climate change for over 30 years. Our work really started back in 2015 when the um, Lancet Commission concluded that anthropogenic climate change threatens to undermine the past 50 years of gains in terms of public health. But the most important conclusion is that they, they also stated that tackling climate change will probably, probably be the, the biggest uh, global health opportunity of the new century. And this is not only because we would avoid the health impact of climate change, but there's also co-benefits associated with mitigation and adaptation strategies. Um, so stemming from that report is where we come. So what we try to do each year is to launch this report with indicators that help us keep track and keep the pulse on the health impacts of climate change and also how we're doing towards adaptation and mitigation towards reaching the Paris Agreement goals. Um, so We've had already um, four reports. The first one was just a call for new indicators. And this is the third report that we're launching with actual data. We currently have 41 indicators. Uh, the methods and the indicators are improved year after year. And we're really, really proud of this one. Uh, the Lancet was also really happy about it, saying it's the best one we've done uh, since the beginning of the project. Um, so most importantly, this is the work, the collaborative work of over 120 experts from around the world that represent 35 institutions. The, the experts ra uh, range from universities to UN institutions, and they work tirelessly to give us the data to pull this report together, and it's really to them that we owe all our, our, our accomplishments and the terrifying report that you have in your hands if you do. Um, so our work is divided in different working groups. We try to look at the health impacts of climate change from every possible aspect. So the first working group looks into the health impacts of climate change, uh, how climate change is affecting our health, 
and how our actions towards climate change are benefiting us. The second working group looks into adaptation of the healthcare systems. The healthcare systems are the forefront of adaptation and are essential to, to, to avoid the, the worst effects of climate change on our health. We also have a working group that works uh, towards looking at mitigation strategies and particularly how our mitigation efforts relate to, to um, health impacts. And finally, the fifth working group, the fourth and fifth working group uh, focus on the economic context and the social political context that will enable the transition towards meeting the Paris Agreement goals. So I'll start by the conclusion. So I'll give you the three key messages of our report, and after that you can just forget about me and go on. But I wanted to, to remember these. These are the, the three take-home messages. The first one is that the life of every child born today will be profoundly affected by climate change. And if we don't accelerate our interventions, climate change will come to define their health and well-being throughout their life. Every child born today will have climate change impacting them throughout every stage of their life, unless we do something. And I think the most worrying conclusion of our report is that we're seeing the effects of climate change on health already today. This is not something that will happen to polar bears only. This is not ha something that will happen in 100 years' time. It's something that we are already seeing. And for example, and thank you, Silvio, for the introduction, um, you mentioned the, the impact of heat waves on, on the elderly. The elderly are particularly susceptible to the, the, the health effects of heat waves, particularly those that have cardiovascular problems or renal problems. And in, in the last year, we've seen 220 million heat wave exposures of those over 65 years old globally. We're also seeing that the increasing temperatures and the climate change is reducing the global yield potential across all major staple crops. This has a huge impact, particularly on young ones that are still growing and on whom the effects of malnutrition are permanent, both on their physical and their intellectual development. We have seen nine out of the 10 most suitable years for the transmission of dengue fever happening since the turn of the century. And 77% of countries experienced an increase in the daily population exposure to wildfires since the beginning of this century. Um, on top of that, and I won't go too much into detail because I know Shura will speak about that a bit further, we've seen 45 billion potential work hours being lost. And this has a huge effect on everyone, not only economic effects, but also on the, on the mental health effects of losing your job or your capacity to work. The second key message is that there's a second path that is possible and it's doable, in which we're limiting global average temperature rise to well below two degrees, meeting the Paris Agreement goals. And that would transform the life of a child born today for the better. We're seeing already hints of the possible transition to a low carbon economy and to meeting the Paris Agreement goals. We're seeing that coal use is falling as a share of um, electricity production, particularly in China, that is one of the main users of coal for power generation. We're seeing that renewables accounted for 45% of growth in power generation capacity in 2018. Um, the low carbon elec uh, electricity production reached 32% the last year, that is huge amounts. Um, we're also seeing improvements in air pollution in Europe, although we're still struggling, there are improvements that also imply a big gain in economical terms because we avoid all the, the, the losses related to air pollution. And carbon pricing revenues are also increasing, we're starting to price carbon accordingly. So there are hints of improvements. So this is the last message, and is that an unprecedented challenge of this dimension requires an um, unprecedented response. We will all have to work really, really hard over the next few years to limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees and making sure that the life of children born today is not determined by a changing climate. Um, we owe it to them. We have been benefiting from the high carbon economy, but in the expense of future generations. So it's time that we step up our game. Um, so I will walk you through the indicators of our different working groups. I've selected a couple of them and tried to highlight Italian data. I won't go too much into the methodologies, but feel free to ask me questions later. I can try to reply to them as best as I can. So the first working group looks into the climate change impacts, exposures, and vulnerabilities. The interaction between climate change and health is really complex. The social mediating factors that will make 
the impacts of climate change worse for certain communities, and at the same time, the impacts of climate change will make social and economic unrest um, even worse. Um, we have here over the top climate-oriented indicators which look into, for example, an increase in the temperatures, an increase in extreme weather events, but all of these kind of more uh, climate-related indicators will impact on health in myriad of different ways. For example, um, increasing temperatures will not only affect the health of the elderly or the very young ones, but will also impact on growth production and therefore will threaten food security. Um, so we try to cover as much as possible. There's still indicators coming years, year after year, and while we try to cover as much as possible, we're really welcome to new suggestions if you have any. So the first thing I wanted to bring your attention to is to the health um, exposure of human populations. <coughs> what you can see in this graph is what, in, in, in orange, can you show orange? Yeah. In orange, you can see what has been the increase in uh, global temperature since the year 2000. We've all heard about this kind of one degree increase in, since pre-industrial times. Since the year 2000, we had seen about a 0.2 degree Celsius of uh, mean global warming. But when we see what's happening in places where people live, so when we weigh this by population, we're seeing that globally, people have been exposed to an average of 0.8% <coughs> increase since the 2000s only. This means that climate change is being much more felt by people where people live than in global averages. And I don't know if you can see it from there, it's a bit small. But when we look at Italy, the temperature change in 2018 since that 2000 baseline is being 1.18 degrees Celsius. So that's kind of the, the same as the global average since pre-industrial times. This has a huge impact on our health. Um, as I said, last year we had 220 million more heat wave um, exposure events in the elderly. Uh, in Italy, um, that has been, I think, 9.3 million in 2017. So 9.3 million people over 65 degrees have been exposed to, to heat waves more in 2017 with respect to the year 2000. Um, we have also had 1.7 million potential work hours lost in 2017 in Italy. 67% of those came from the agricultural sector, therefore also affecting food security. Um, so that is to say, when we look at global averages, the, the, the human aspect of climate change is much, much worse. Um, probably appropriate to talk about flooding in this climate age in Venice. While the flooding that you had here last year, I don't need to tell this to you, we cannot really attribute climate change to them, they're multifactorial. What we are seeing across the world is that the patterns of rainfall are changing. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. It's not a good idea to add videos to presentations, I think. Oh, maybe. Oh, there. So here you can see how um, extreme rainfall is being changing year after year. And I think it's clear to see that while there has been an increase in extreme rainfall events, in blue you have a, an increase um, in extreme rainfall as a proxy for flooding. What we're measuring here is the five-day rolling sum of daily total precipitation that exceeds the 10-year return level for a, a 1986 baseline. And as you can see, we have areas all around the world that have seen an increase in the number of extreme rainfall events. Some also reduce the number of extreme rainfall events. But the most worrying thing is that you see much more color in this map than you did in the first ones, which means that the, the pattern of rainfall is being affected. And if I had shown you the pattern of drought events that is measured in a six-month average of total precipitation, you would have seen that the Amazon has also experienced big droughts. What this means is that they've experienced six months or more of huge droughts and then it rained massively in a couple of days. And that's a huge impact for, not only for the transmission of um, waterborne diseases, for sanitation, but also for food production. We've also been talking about the suitability for infectious disease transmission. We have seen that since the turn of the century, we had nine, nine out of the 10 most suitable years for the transmission of dengue worldwide. Dengue fever has been spreading. It particularly affects children. The worst cases of dengue are always experienced by children. And when we look at Italy, there has been a 50% increase in the vectorial capacity for Aedesol vopictus transmission of dengue since uh, 1979 to, uh, to 1982. 
the vectorial capacity practically measures the, the, the likelihood of the vector to transmit the dengue virus from one infected person to another one. So what we're measuring here is how likely the mosquito that lives in Europe, the is the Albopectus, is to transmit the disease if they find it. The vectorial capacity for dengue in Italy is still quite low, and we don't really find endemic dengue in Europe just yet. However, what this is telling us is that the conditions are being increasingly suitable for the transmission of these type of diseases. And our greatest fear is that there will come a point when conditions will be so suitable that if you introduce a case of dengue in Europe, it will start spreading. And this is particularly problematic for countries that are not used to seeing this type of, of diseases. If we find dengue in Argentina, we know what it is, we diagnose it, we identify it, and we know how to act because we have it already. This is imposing an extra burden on health systems that are not adapted just yet to cope with this type of diseases. And that's why adaptation of the healthcare systems and learning about these uh, hazards prematurely is so important. Finally, I've been talking a lot about uh, food security and undernutrition. We have seen, uh, so what you have here, I hope you can see it properly, is um, the crop yield potential across staple crops around the world. These are crops that are essential for nutrition throughout the world. And while nutrition uh, and the access to, to food is a political problem, we all know that we're currently producing enough food to feed the whole world, but we still have enormous levels of undernutrition. What we're trying to measure here is how, how climate change is affecting the biological aspect of food production. Um, you can see here we have maize, winter wheat, soybean, and rice. And what we have seen is that the, 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 the potential production of all of these crops has been reducing since the 1960s. There has been a 6% reduction in the crop yield potential for winter wheat, 4% for maize uh, and for rice, and 3% for soybean. And I wanted to show you the numbers for Italy. Um, here you have the same uh, staple crops. We have had a 10.2% reduction for maize, 5% for winter wheat, 6 for spring wheat, 7 for soybean, and 5% for rice in Italy since the 1960s baseline. This is a 10-year uh, rolling average. In Italy, we still have an increase in food production, and that's because we have a lot of technology to help us cope with this extra pressure. But when we look at small producers, those that don't have access to these technologies, um, especially the subsistence farmers, we're seeing more and more the crop production falling, and that affects particularly food security of the young ones. In 30 countries last year, the crop yields have been reducing. The affected crop yield has been reducing. And what this tells us is that if we continue on this path, there will come a point in which we won't be able to, to, to make up with these losses through technology, and we'll, have, we'll start finding effective reductions. This is only measuring temperature. So how this indicator is calculated, we take a look into how long it takes for the seeds to accumulate the total temperature they need to mature. And we're seeing that that length of time is getting shorter and shorter, which means that seeds mature fast, and when they mature, they yield smaller uh, seeds, so the crop yields are, are being reduced. So we're already seeing the health effects of climate change. And what that means is that we have a huge burden on health systems, and the health systems are at the forefront of climate change adaptation. We really need health systems to adapt to this new challenge. So what the working group two does is trying to measure adaptation of healthcare systems throughout the world. Our first indicator, we're seeing that countries are starting to prepare for the health risk of climate change. This is a survey uh, done by WHO in which countries report whether they have a national adaptation plan and risk assessment for climate change and what's their degree of implementation. The good news is that since the 2015 um, previous launch of this uh, survey, in 2015 we had only seen 40 countries responding. Now we have 101 countries responding, which means that countries are starting to engage with this as a problem they have to deal with. However, only about 50% of those report to have a national plan in place to deal with the health risk of climate change. And what's even more concerning is that we only have 24 countries with a high or even moderate level of implementation, and the budget is only covered for 17% of them, even if only partially. So this means that while we are acknowledging the problem, we still have to act on it. 
most importantly, the, 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 the effects of climate change are experienced locally. So it's people in local communities that are experiencing the worst effects of climate change, particularly in those kind of more deprived communities. So this is from CDP data. They measure at the um, climate change risk assessments done by cities around the world. And what we can see is that almost 70% of all the cities that, we that, that answered to the survey in 2018 are actively developing or have completed a comprehensive climate change risk or vulnerab vulnerability assessment. And then 54% of those expect climate change to seriously compromise their public health infrastructure. This is an increase with respect to 2017 where only 51% reported this. So it means that cities are increasingly engaging to, into climate change as being a health issue and are starting to notice that they have to act. However, we see big inequalities in the countries that, in the cities that do respond. This is a voluntary survey, and we see mostly respondents from high-income countries. When we look at Italy, we have 14, uh, 14 Italian cities that responded. 80% of them have or are carrying out a risk assessment currently. But it takes no genius to notice that they are all stuck in the north. So even here, we see the inequality north to south. Spending on adaptation is essential. Healthcare systems need to have more funding to be able to face this extra hazard. So what this indicator does is to measure um, the amount of resources focused on health adaptation and on health-related adaptation, which also takes into account disaster preparedness and agriculture. So we can see here that uh, total health adaptation spending has been increasing. It increased by 11.2% uh, in 2018, and it reached 5% of total climate change adaptation spending. That's only a 5%. Each. So we're trying to adapt the systems that will impact us the most, and adapting our healthcare systems is essential to reduce the, the, the impacts on humans of climate change. But only a 5% of all adaptation spending is currently being spent on the healthcare systems. Um, the good thing is that we're increasing by 11.2% our spending in healthcare, while total, adaptation on, uh, total spending on adaptation has increased by 6.5% uh, 6 only. So it means that we're growing more and more the, the spending on health. And as you can see here, the, the, the regions that increase the spending more, most are Europe and the Americas. So there's still a gap there to be filled by other countries. So starting to do something about it, but not quite yet. Our next working group um, looks into mitigation actions. Mitigation actions will come mainly from trying to reduce emissions, trying to reduce our impact on the planet. So we have indicators that um, lay on the kind of emissions sectors. But for instance, when we talk about um, transport, we talk about how to make cities, uh, how to get cities to use less cars and to have more active ways of transport. That means cycling, walking to work, that implies healthier transport, more physical activity, and it has very positive health effects. At the same time, if we're talking about uh, agriculture, we know that um, ruminants have a big impact on the climate. They contribute a lot to, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. So reducing the meat consumption, reducing ruminant produ meat production, will also lead to healthier diets in the sense that we will be incorporating more vegetables to our diet. And that also has a huge impact. So, um, the obvious thing to look at when we talk about mitigation is the carbon intensity of the energy system. The carbon intensity looks at the um, greenhouse gas emissions per unit of unit produced for total primary energy supply. And what you have in this graph, um, the, the, the lines here, they are the, um, uh, the, the tons of CO2 per terajoule of total primary energy supply, so the carbon intensity. And the bar graph shows you the total emissions of the, health, uh, of the power generation. So first thing I wanted to focus on, the emissions had been settling down since like 2013, 2014, but unfortunately since then they started increasing again at a, two per, at a rate of 2.6% uh, till 2018. So we're again on a growing trajectory on our emissions of uh, greenhouse gas. You can also see here, it's not too obvious, but the, the, the line that goes here is the total primary energy supply of the global energy system. So this is globally. And you can see that it hasn't really been changing much. And that is mainly because while some regions and countries are doing big efforts in reducing their emissions, this line here going down is Europe. So Europe has been reducing its um, carbon intensity of the total primary energy supply a lot. However, you have other regions 
for example, China has been increasing and driving that, um, that flatness of the global primary energy supply. To give you an idea, to get to level consistent with the 1.5 target, by the, end, by the 2050, we need to reduce our emissions at a rate of 7.4% per year. So we're really far from that. Again, zero carbon emission electricity, and I wanted to highlight this one because Italy is doing great. Um, in 2018, renewable energy sources accounted for 45% of all the growth in energy production. That is brilliant. 27% of that growth came from wind and solar, which are the kind of what we call the new renewables that have the least impact on the environment. And 32% of global energy generation, as I told you before, came from zero carbon sources. So we are moving in the right direction in this aspect. We still have a very low amount of contribution to the total primary energy supply coming from solar. Only 2% of it comes from, uh, from, from solar energy production. So we really need to increase it. But the good news is that it's increasing at a rate of 14%. To reach the 2050 target, we need the, the, the total production of energy to increase by 9.7% per annum, which means that we're doing very good. But it's easy to increase when you start from zero. So we have to keep it up. And as I said before, I wanted to highlight uh, here Italy. This is the average for Europe. So Italy is almost twice. And the final indicator for this working group is one that has made the headlines in the past days. Premature mortality from ambient air pollution is a huge worry. Ambient air pollution, per se, doesn't produce climate change, but it comes from the same sources that do. So it comes from the burning of fossil fuels, from the burning of coal. In 2016, there were almost 3 million premature deaths due to PM2.5 pollution. And global mortality has remained stagnant since the last year. PM2.5 is the small particles in suspension. They are the most harmful way of air pollution, and the harder one to get rid of. Almost half a million premature deaths came from coal use only. And that's really important because coal is the most carbon-intensive fossil, uh, carbon fossil fuel that we have. So we really need to start phasing up coal. And the most concerning finding is that in the Euro region of WHO, Italy is leading the number of deaths. Um, they had, you had almost 46,000 premature deaths in 2016 only due to ambient air pollution. This has slightly reduced from the previous year. I think it was in 47.5 the previous year, but it's still a huge amount of deaths. So, economics and finance, it all comes down to that, doesn't it? In this sector, we try to see the economic and financial enablers, as well as the economic and financial costs of the health impacts of air pollution. If we don't start shifting our economy towards a low carbon economy, we'll get nowhere. So once again, the economic cost of air pollution, every single death, every single sick person, apart from being a problem for public health, a social problem, is also an economic problem. In Europe, while we have seen, so I don't know if you can see it very well from here, but here you have the economic uh, costs due to life loss, premature deaths due to air pollution in different countries. And the first country here is Italy. It's been uh, 20 billion euros lost last year due to the premature deaths caused by air pollution in Italy. However, you can see that there's a small increase Europe has been making loads of efforts to reduce its air pollution. And by these small changes that you barely see there, Europe has saved itself 5.2 uh, billion euros if they continue with this trajectory. So even small reductions in air pollution mean a lot to the economy. And the important thing here is that if we continue at 2016 levels, the EU will have to face 129 billion euros loss per year. What this means is that when we talk about the cost of decarbonizing the economy, when we talk about the cost of transitioning to the Paris Agreement goals, we also have to take into account the huge costs in terms of life losses that, that are economic costs. It has to be put in the balance as well. Um, to make that transition to a low carbon economy, we really need to start investing in zero carbon energy. Here you have uh, the, the energy investments throughout the years. 
in green, you have investments in renewables and nuclear. This includes nuclear, which is zero carbon, and is one of our main, main sources of um, zero carbon energy. What you can see here is that investments in zero carbon energy are only 20% of investments in the global energy system in 2018. If we want to reach the Paris Agreement goal by 2030, we need to be at least 65% of total annual investments, so we're really far off. And improving investments in this area means not only achieving the low carbon economy, but also generating jobs in a different sector and starting to prepare for that transition. And finally, for this indicator group, I wanted to show um, coverage and strength, strength of carbon pricing. So carbon pricing is essential for the transition to a low carbon economy because it starts internalizing the, the negative externalities of CO2 emissions. There's many countries still today, Argentina, my country is one of them, that has subsidies for fossil fuel burning. So the consumption of fossil fuel is still being subsidized. That artificially lowers the, the cost of fossil fuels. And it's understandable, some economies really depend on it. But what that encourages is a higher consumption of fossil fuels. This explores the other side. This explores how we're taxing CO2 emissions, how we're internalizing those negative externalities a bit better. And what we can see is that in 2019, carbon pricing uh, cover 13.1% of global emissions only. They're higher, so we've increased the price of the, of the global emissions, but the average way so the average of all the carbon prices is $13.8 per unit of CO2. But if we look at all the emissions globally, that is only $1.76 per unit of CO2 emission. If we want to meet the Paris Agreement goal, we need this to be from 40 to 80%. We're currently at 1.76. And this is a very important political problem because how do you make countries which depend so much on fossil fuels increase the cost of those fossil fuels without having massive political unrest. We've seen it in Ecuador, we've seen it in Paris. So how we implement this and how we use the revenues of carbon taxes is essential. And we're increasingly seeing the revenues of carbon taxes being used for adaptation of healthcare system, which is really, really positive. And our last working group looks into public and political engagement. We need to start engaging with politicians a bit better and we need to start engaging with society a bit better and with companies a bit better, and media is essential for this. So that's what we measure in this working group. So one of our indicators try to, tries to measure how people are engaging with the problem of, of climate change and uh, health. And the way we do this is by looking at uh, Wikipedia Quick Screen Media, which is quite a fun thing to do. What we do here is we search into all the Wikipedia articles and we see from the health articles how many people click to go to a climate change article. And from climate change articles, how many people click to go to a health <coughs> article. And in that way, we use that as a proxy to see how people are relating these two, two issues. When we read something in Wikipedia that has to do with health, do we care to find out what climate change is doing for that subject and vice versa? So what is pretty obvious here, here you have uh, health-related articles are in blue and climate change-related articles are in, in red. And what you can see is that they cluster very well with each other. So we have a lot of co-clicks between climate change articles, we have a lot of co-clicks between public health articles, but clicks from public health to climate change or climate change to, uh, to public health are much more limited and we only have very, very few that start finding. In fact, we have from health to climate change only a 0.18% of total co-clicks. And from climate change to health, we have 1.12% co-clicks. So we're still not making that link in our mind. We're still seeing these as separate subjects. And as I mentioned, it's really important to start to get our politicians to acknowledge that climate change is a massive public health problem. So what this indicator does, it tries to track the um, dimensions of climate change and health. So it measures how many words were mentioned for climate change and health and how they were related to each other. Um, in, in speeches made by national leaders at the UN general debate. So what you can see here, the blue line is health mentions quite high, climate change men mentions spiking since the year 2000, also remaining quite high. So politicians are engaging on th these two topics independently. However, the way in which they relate climate change with health, that's marked by the intersection here, is still pretty low. 
And the most concerning thing of all is that this trend, if we look at the list of the countries that made mentions in the last five years, Italy is not there, for example. But the countries that are actually making the links are the small island developing states, which are at huge risk of climate change. And they've been asking us, begging us to pay attention to them for years. And I wanted to close up my, my indicator uh, show off with this uh, part of a speech from Dominica that they did last year. And what they say is that climate change arises from activities that support and reflect inequalities. It is the poor whose lands are impacted by severe droughts and flooding and whose homes are destroyed and whose loved ones perish. It is the poor who have the least capacity to escape the heavy bur burdens of poverty, disease, and health. So really wrapping up everything we've been speaking so far about and highlighting that this is very much a problem of inequality and that if we don't act now, it will be those that are already disfavored, the ones that have the biggest impacts. And I'm not talking about economic position. I'm also talking about disfavor in terms of their age. The children that are the most vulnerable, the elderly that are the most vulnerable will be the ones that suffer the health effects of climate change the most. So just to wrap up, the 50 messages again. If we don't act fast, the life of every child born today will be affected by climate change throughout their lifetime. But we do have the resources, we do have the technology, and we do have the capacity to make that shift to a two degree um, scenario. We just have to be clever about it, about how we're starting to plan our cities, how we're starting to invest in our energy production. And this is an unprecedented challenge, and we all really need to step up our game. We saw it in every indicator that I showed you. It's so hard for us to find hope. But there are glimpses of hope, and we know that we can do this transition. So just as a wrap-up, what we really want to give the message out, especially to politicians, is we need rapid, urgent, and complete phase-out of coal that is producing so much air pollution and so much CO2 emissions that are unnecessary. We need to have high-income countries comply with the international climate finance commitments of $100 billion a year by 2020 to help the low-income countries make that development, development gap and also meet the, the, the Paris Agreement goals. We need to increase um, our funding on efficient and low-carbon emitting transport systems, especially like active transport, bike, walking to work. We have to plan our cities accordingly. And we have to make huge investments in the health um, sector for adaptation of the health sector, because that's what will hold our communities together. And with all the impacts that I've been telling you about, there will be a huge burden on, on healthcare systems, and they need to be able to cope. Otherwise, the health impacts of climate change will be so much worse. And with that, I just want to close by thanking you all for listening, um, especially thanking our 120 collaborators and 35 institutions that work with us to give us all the data for these indicators. Um, and I'm happy to take questions from the audience. So the health adaptation spend comes from uh, resource allocation from countries in particular. So they're self-reported. Uh, that always has limitations because when you talk about adaptation spend, you don't talk about the, the effect of that adaptation spend or what you've accomplished with that adaptation spend. So that comes from self-reported data. As I said, we have two different um, indicators for that. One is spend on healthcare systems and healthcare infrastructure that is exclusively for the national healthcare system. We don't take into account private investment, for instance. It's only for public health adaptation system. Um, and when we talk about health-related, we're also talking about food production and um, 
the, the adaptation response to extreme weather events that in some countries is really massive, especially for the small island states. That is a big part of what they, they consider health adaptation. But again, that's all self-reported by the countries. Uh, so that's one of the big limitations. It's really hard to measure adaptation effects. So how efficient our adaptation measures are being, uh, especially at a global level. Uh, with respect to air conditioning, yeah, we do have an indicator that measures air conditioning. Um, so we're seeing an increase in the use of air conditioning around the world. On the one hand, it's essential for certain communities to have air conditioning, especially when you have scorching temperatures. Um, all people today don't have much possibilities in many countries. The reason why I don't like focusing too much on air conditioning is because it's not the only way you can cool down a building. Uh, there's lots of different types of constru constructions and uh, different types of certifications for sustainable uh, building, such as the LEED uh, certification in the US, this one of Korea, I don't remember the name, um, in which you can cool down a building super efficiently, even the same as for air conditioning without the use of, um, of energy. And what we're seeing with air conditioning is that although there's deaths potentially prevented due to uh, exposure to heat by air conditioning, by cooling down buildings uh, through energy use, we've all experienced this. In a hot city, you walk down the street and you have the air conditioning in your face coming from a building, and you have all that hot air that contributes to the, um, to the urban heat island effect and that contributes to the high increase in temperatures experienced in cities. So it's really a double-edged sword. When you're inside, you're really cool. But as soon as you step outside, you have all these air conditioning units uh, pumping out heat from the buildings and really increasing not only emissions, but also temperature in cities. So we're trying to kind of emphasize how important it is that despite the rising temperatures, we shouldn't increase the use of air conditioning. We should try to invest in cleverer ways of constructions that are available, better insulation, um, trying to build many traditional buildings, traditional ways of buildings, we're already prepared for this. Not building these kind of huge skyscrapers that are completely covered in glass. That's the worst thing we can do. So trying to be more clever about the way we start building cities in the future to try not to depend so much on AC. Thank you very much for the presentation, it was very interesting. And the example of air conditioning somehow is uh, good because it gives an idea of what we were showing before with the co-benefits, because every co-benefit can also be somehow a trade-off if uh, adaptation is actually made in a, the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, curious if you intend to actually quantify and map not only the co-benefits, but the possible other side of the coin, which could be the trade-offs between health and adapting to it. And also, um, second line of question is just that um, if you have some data about Brazil and if there's any specific issue related to that country, that would be a good. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to open up a whole area of maladaptation that we call it. That is when you try to adapt to something and you make more harm than benefit. So yeah, we, we definitely are looking into maladaptation. Um, there's a lot of discussion as well into the transition to a low carbon economy. If not done properly, and if you don't reduce the subsidies for fossil fuels in a clever way, if you don't tax fossil fuels in a clever way, the cost can be a lot, for, especially for countries that still need to, do the, to, to jump the development gap. So you have to do that cleverly and in such a way that you minimize harm. If we were today to stop all of a sudden all CO2 emissions from one day to the next, our societies would collapse. That would be a horrible idea. We need to do that in a clever way as fast as possible, we really need to step up the game, but we have the technology to do it cleverly. So that's one of the things we really need to measure, uh, maladaptation. And yeah, for Brazil, we have a lot of data. We actually had a Brazilian policy brief um, that's probably on our website. I don't remember any numbers off the top of my head, but food production was a big deal over there. Uh, wildfires, the floodings in the Amazon, the drought in the Amazon, uh, yeah. And just for everyone who's interested, if you go to lancetcountdown.org, We've recently launched a database platform, so we're trying to democratize our data. And in the report, we're focusing on a global level. So our indicators try to track what's happening around the world. We don't have space. It's 40 pages, and we still cannot cover every country. So if you go to lancetcountdown.org, 
it says explore our data, and there is a database platform where you can enter each of these indicators and see what's happening at, in your own country, so you have interactive uh, visualization. And there you, you can probably extract if you're interested in Brazil, there's gonna be something interesting there for sure. Giovanni Cecconi, Venice Resilience Lab. I am working in this uh, local action. So my question is uh, how we can help uh, as a Venetian uh, into this, uh, to organize this uh, unprecedented uh, response to this uh, great program. I think Venice is a great arena and a showroom, uh, a permanent uh, exhibition, whatever happens in Venice is relevant. So which use can we make of this uh, visibility in order to help your action? Oh, what a question. Um, everything, <laughs> everything. Um, yes, so but from where to start? Next, so next year we have the COP, the pre-COP happening here in Italy. So one of the things we really need to focus on now is to get attention of media and attention of politicians. So anything we can do to spread out the word. I've tried to pull out indicators that are specific for Italy in the report. We don't have the granularity or the resolution to actually pull out Venice in particular, but we do have quite nice indicators for Italy. Italy in general has good data, so we can produce the indicators quite so, nicely. Mm -hmm. So if you want to pull that out, if, if there's anything that you can say, well, this is very relevant to Italian politics, you know much more about that than me, feel free to use them, use our name, mm -hmm. and lobby whoever you can lobby. Next year with COP, the pre-COP happening here, we really have a good opportunity in Italy to start persuading governments. At the moment, uh, I am working in a project that is called Earthbook. If you know what is happening, maybe you can help. That is, uh, is based on borrowing each other and pairing the different local communities, starting with the child from six to 12, doing a co-exploration, citizen science, but also festival to celebrate what we have because we have to start from what we have so if i can contribute let me know i have a Absolutely. network of uh, around uh, 500 community all over the world uh, and now i'm starting in venice this exercise with the people fantastic let's have a chat anything we can do to engage public opinion that that is the most important thing i think uh politicians tend to be quite deaf to most things yes, but so. if we all start demanding at once. As you know, there are a lot of problems in Venice that are not solved yet. And what I'm trying to do, exactly what you said, not to do advice, but to allow the people to ask for their needs. Pasolini used to say, the poor are the ones that are not able to speak. So if we teach them how to speak, part of the problem is solved. Absolutely, happy to chat. Thank you. See how we can collaborate. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions, actually. Uh, one is um, if you have somehow uh, investigated or have you some insight on the role of green in cities to improve uh, uh, health quality, so the use of this new nature-based solution in cities to, to improve our health. And the other is, the second one is about how the increasing disaster floods and yeah, exceptional events that are happening are somehow influencing health or mental health and yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, green cities is something that we're exploring now. Um, land use in cities is really important when you have a city that is completely covered in cement. The heat effect is much more. So it has a direct effect on warming. It also has an effect on mental health. The problem that we're having is that we really don't want to do any speculations. We have to really give robust data. There's a lot of questioning of climate change impacts. So we really need to be very careful about what we show. And we only show data which we're 100% sure that there's good research backing up that relationship. We're struggling to find good studies to back the relationship between mental health and city greenness. So that's why we're not kind of focusing too much on that. But we are trying to develop now an indicator that will measure green space in urban areas and trying to see particularly how that breaks the urban heat island effect. So that's something that we're looking for. Um, with respect to extreme weather events, we have one indicator on the lethality of extreme weather events. So what that looks into is how many people died 
for extreme weather events over the last year. And we also have indicators that track how many extreme weather events there were. So we do have that. It's quite limited what we can do in that aspect because in many countries that have very big extreme weather events that are uh, less developed countries, um, we don't have the numbers, the recording of number of deaths that sometimes goes, goes, waste, like goes lost. So we can't really track it globally very well just yet. Um, but what we do have that is quite interesting is the economic cost of extreme weather events. That's much more registered because countries keep their, their budget quite closely. And one of the worrying things that we're seeing is that while the economic losses perhaps are bigger in high income countries because they have more assets that they can lose, so economically it represents a bigger percentage, in the percentage of GDP, low and middle income countries, those losses are never insured. So in high, middle in, uh, in high income countries, you have big losses, but they're mostly insured, so the impact on the people is relatively low. In low middle income countries, those losses aren't getting insured, and it's people who pay for them. So that's kind of the, 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 the biggest aspect that we can track. Towards deaths, yeah, we do have an indicator for lethality of weather events, but it's, it's always a bit difficult to measure because of the lack of data. Thank you very much. Um, um, many cities are declaring their state of climate emergency right now. Um, and usually this means that they can use a lot of money um, and um, use it outside the law in a certain way, in a more quicker way. Uh, what do you think would be uh, the priority for a mayor? Um, the first thing to do to help the health, health sector uh, in climate change adaptation. So what would be the first uh, thing to do in a city with a lot of money outside the law. You can sell it later. <laughs> Let, let's try to stay in the law. Um, so, as a city, you have two things you have to deal with. One is infrastructure. Um, at the city level, you sometimes have low power to change the energy production system, but you can make investments towards uh, helping uh, individuals and houses and uh, have more kind of solar panels, and that's something that can be done uh, at a local level. So that would be one thing, to try to invest in, in greening the, the energy production at a residential level. Um, there's a lot of emissions that come from uh, the use of biomass in the domestic sector that generates a lot of um, air pollution that contributes to all these deaths also in Italy. So trying to green the energy uh, sector at the residential sector is one thing you can do. And Adapting the healthcare systems, trying to, I mean, adaptation in healthcare systems will have to do with everything on how you cope with uh, increased floodings, increased droughts, on how you cope with uh, new infectious diseases, training medics, um, trying to get more, uh, the hospitals to be more robust to extreme weather events. For example, when you're in a, in a small island state that it has hurricanes, they have huge losses of their uh, public health infrastructure because of extreme weather events, because they're not resilient enough. So it will depend on where you are, where your caveats are. But the first thing to do any of that is to have a climate change risk assessment and see where your risk lies. And that will, it's very city dependent. Uh, each city will have different risks and having the risk assessment done in place is the first step you have to take. It's, it doesn't cost that much to do the risk assessment. To do something about it is what's pricey. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have a question. Um, have you investigated the role of uh, state and the relationship between uh, uh, public um, expenditure and private expenditure uh, on the health system um, because of uh, the importance of this topic, for example, I think about the USA uh, elections, or, but also for uh, Italian public uh, uh, debt. I mean, uh, what is the, the role, what, what is the, the role that you have um, found in your research, and if you have any tips uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this relationship, and thank you. So we haven't really explored the, the private sector much, and that's because the private sector is very um, uh, particular in each country. It's really easy when you're talking about uh, governmental level. We all have 
in our governments, um, a public health department, a public health ministry, and that's really easy to track. The private sector is much more difficult. Also, when it comes to how you define climate, uh, the, the private sector, uh, public health, uh, the, the health system. Do you include also kind of a mental well-being, uh, social services? It's a, a bit of a blurry line. So we don't really have any indicator measuring private uh, investments. But, and probably a biochemist is not the best to say this, um, public health systems are always the foundation of health in any country. Uh, even if you have strong private, for instance, back in Argentina, we have strong private health systems. Still, the public health system is the one that leads the game. Um, so yeah, I, I can't really give you much of an answer about that. But I would really kind of try to focus also on private health, uh, public health systems rather than private. If no more questions, then we'll move on to the next batch of presentations. Thank you, Marina. That was Thank brilliant. You. Thank you very much. So my task here is to sort of give an overview of the relevant research that we do at CMCC and Kafoskeli, relevant to Lancet Countdown, one, but two, sort of give a future perspective what, on what is going to happen if we keep on this path. So I'm sure Odash Gupta, I work at Fondazino CMCC as a full-time researcher, but I am also affiliated to University of Venice, Kafoskeli, as a lecturer currently. And I'm trying to, I'm also going to try and pull out specific numbers for Europe and for Italy. I know there was a question about what is going to happen in regions. We can see that. So our focus currently in the group I'm working with is on climate change impact on labor supply and labor productivity. We know that both of these generally deteriorate beyond the temperature threshold. However, the exposure response functions that measure this relationship currently are rather weak. Yes, this is a big criticism, but we believe this is a valid criticism. What we are trying to do is we are trying to empirically improve these response functions. We use both microsurvey data and high resolution data that I'll come in details to. But this is a sort of an overview of what we're trying to achieve here. Let's start with impacts on Europe. For the European research, this is part of COACH. It's a Horizon 2020 project which CMCC coordinates. It's led by Professor Francesco Bozzello. In this case, we use labor productivity data at the NUTS2 level from 28 EU countries. We then combine this with high resolution climatic data to first estimate sectoral response functions for labor productivity. And then in the second step, we use these functions to estimate the future impact of climate change under various warming scenarios. Let's look at the estimated response functions first. So on the left-hand side, you have agriculture. On the right-hand side, you have industry. So the first thing that becomes clear is that agricultural productivity or agricultural labor productivity is maximized at an optimal temperature which is, almost, which is four degrees Celsius lower than that in the industrial sector. Essentially, the message, message here is that in the agricultural sector, labor productivity is maximized at a much lower temperature range, okay? So if you can see, 
the, the curve, the concave curve shows that as temperature increases, labor productivity initially increases too, but beyond the threshold, there is a stark decline. And you also notice that the decline beyond the threshold for the agricultural sector is much sharper, much steeper than, this, than the industrial sector. So this is one of our contributions to begin with. But what happens in the future with unmitigated climate change, or sort of? So this is the agricultural sector. We estimate that under a two degree warming scenario, which will probably reach very easily at this rate, by 2060, agricultural labor productivity will decline by more than 11% in Europe. Stark differences. If we move on to the industrial sector, the industrial labor productivity, mostly driven by, remember, the lower optimal condition, it will still decline by more than 8%. These are huge declines, even for Europe. Yes, the European economy is, is reeling, but it's still one of the strongest. And the climate change impacts are going to be stark, strong, all over. But we can even break this down further. In the agricultural sector, on the left column, you see the biggest losers. On the right-hand side, you see the biggest gainers. Yes, climate change is a double-edged sword because some regions will actually gain due to warming. Look at Basilicata. Remember the name, Basilicata. We'll come back to Basilicata more. But even in Europe, as we, we know that the north, some of the rich, relatively rich northern regions will gain. Trentino Alto Adige, Valle de Osta. They will gain due to warming. And even in the, in the in industrial sector, well, the Osta will make some gains in, in Italy. But even then, the, the losers due to climate change will lose about 20 to 20 percent, 22% of their labor productivity in the future. Now that we have looked into Europe, let's switch focus and extract the data for Italy. What is going to happen in Italy? I, I'm an adopted Venetian, so I have, I have oh, here we go. Again. The same impacts, we have pulled out the data for Italy. Left-hand side, agriculture. Right-hand side, industry. In Italy, agricultural labor productivity will decline by 13.3%, higher than the European average. In the industrial sector, this decline will be 11.5%, higher than the average. This goes back to the stark issues Italy is going to face due to climate change. We have seen premature deaths and we have seen labor productivity. And the Italian geography is peculiar. It is very interesting. This is what makes the country beautiful, but it also poses so many more challenges. The hotter, relatively poorer south is again going to face more challenges than the relatively rich and colder north. And this comes back over and over again. Again, remember this picture, economic impacts in Italy. We published it as part of the state of the green economy in Italy two weeks ago in a commando. This is the first time that such an analysis has been done for Italy. We use gridded data at 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer resolution, run special regression, special econometric regressions, and then use those co estimates to see what is going to happen in the future. Let's put all this together, the decline in labor productivity in the industrial and the agricultural sector, and the feedback effect on the economy as a whole. We project that the Italian GDP will decline by 8.5% by 20 to 2080 due to climate change. And again, look at 2050. There are big losses, but look at 2080. The losses are much starker, much redder. Okay, red in this case is very bad. But again, look at the geographical difference within the country the richer, relatively richer, relatively colder north will make some gains, but the relatively poorer and relatively hotter southern regions in Italy will continue to lose. But GDP and labor productivity are probably not the only things and probably not the most important things. We also estimate that income inequality which is directly linked to our health, will increase in Italy. 
both in by 2050 and by 2080. Italy, according to our estimates, is the only G20 nation where income inequality will increase by 2080. Remember the name Basilicata. In this map, and also here, Basilicata keeps coming back as the region which will lose out the most by GDP, and it, will, it is also the region where inequality will increase the highest. It's important that we focus on it now. So, what I've tried to put together is labor productivity related to climate change, and then look at the feedback effects on the Italian GDP. The impacts are strong and mostly negative. And then, and then what we have is an increase in income inequality, which has huge repercussions on our health system and our health. So this has been what has been, this has been a, so, well, so far what we have done. What we plan to do in the future, global impacts. We have put together a data set of 56 million observations, which is representative at the sub-national level for the whole world. We have combined census data, labor force surveys, and other household surveys. This is what it looks like. We have almost 10,000 sub-national geographic regions from 89 countries all over the world. Subnational as in not through region. So again, we'll break this down by sectors, high exposure, low exposure, and services. We'll run robust special econometric regressions to estimate empirical re response functions first. Lots of stuff, I don't want to go into that. But again, our initial analysis shows that in the high exposure sector, the temperature maximizing labor supply is around 19.8 degrees almost a full three degrees lower than the low exposure sector. We expect this. We expect that the optimal conditions or the optimal temperature maximizing labor supply in the high exposure sector should be lower because workers in this sector are more exposed to the elements. But we needed to put out the difference. We needed to estimate what is the difference, and it's almost three degrees. So. In the, our next step is to use these estimated response functions, combine this with future climate data, and compute changes in labor supply due to climate change going to the future. So, here ends my story for the day. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to take questions or comments. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so how do you determine the optimum temperature in the different work sectors? Is that physiologically determined, and how do you measure it? So it's a very good question. It's, it's empirically or econometrically estimated. So we segregate the data by sector, and so we have data for number of hours work, and of course we have the data for the temperature that that, that worker faced in that sector. So we run a nonlinear regression where we have the coefficients through which we estimate the optimal temperature in the different sectors. But it's dependent on the energy expended by the worker, I suppose. And the number of hours worked. Uh, the number of hours. So really the expensive. energy expended that's looking, the current Lancet indicator looks at capacity. Yeah. We actually use observed data look, to look at labor supply. There is uh, any chance or attempt to consider the non-linearity and adaptation that uh, occurs. So you, your model is linear, so it's just uh, the momentum of the system, but as soon as something happens, uh, we have jumps, uh, discontinuities, reorganization. This is how nature is working, and also humans. So how can you envisage the future apart from the extrapolation of linear model? I would disagree with the linearity comment. It's not, because we do take into account the nonlinear movements of both temperature and other, so let's say income. We do take into account the, the labor-leisure relationship with, because we have data on income also. But the future projection comment is very relevant. We do take into our, it is based on a Ceteris, the Ceteris Paribus, 
that the only thing that changes in the future is climate, but we know that autonomous adaptation does take place. We know that in various countries, work is being shifted to the night, so workers are working at night, but for agricultural sector, that is more often than not possible, right? In, but in the industrial sector, we are currently using this response functions to look at changes in industrial labor productivity or labor supply when a lot of the work is being switched to the night. So instead of maximum temperature, then we look at minimum temperature. But that is a good point. But our results are based on autonomous adaptation. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. And in your empirical framework, have you been interacting the um, uh, coefficient, let's say, linking uh, temperature and GDP to any variable that could somehow proxy adaptive capacity to understand if some regions can actually have cope better and in this case then could adapt Yes, so we, we do take into account differentiating slopes based on both geography. So we have the interacting geographical, uh, regional fixed effects and also temperature income relationship to look into it. So with labor supply, surprisingly, actually, actually not so surprisingly, the differences in the response, the response functions are not as stark as you find when you look at income or GDP in general, right? So there is this new finding also, I would say. That's a very good point. So because I'm also the moderator, let's move on to the next batch of presentations. We start in with Professor Campos Prince, with his more policy-oriented Thank you very much. Sorry, right. And uh, well, um, thank you for organization of, of this uh, uh, of this presentation, and uh, uh, thank you for having me here. That's not mine. This is mine. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if I, I will be uh, uh, as able as Marina has tried to, uh, to simplify very complex, and you have an excellent presentation, because uh, it, it's, uh, it's really complex, and there are so many issues that uh, are the uh, link between climate change and uh, uh, and health uh, are leading. And, uh, okay. And uh, uh, what I will try uh, to help uh, uh, to uh, explain a bit this is to use uh, the simple traffic light uh, 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 colors. And uh, uh, this is my uh, view of uh, what uh, is the situation in Italy right now, because we know that uh, eventually we need preparedness and, uh, uh, but to have preparedness uh, uh, first, uh, and it has been already said today, a uh, first step is awareness. If there is not awareness by individuals, public opinion, and the politician and policymakers, uh, uh, we will not never be prepared. And uh, behind this, we need knowledge. And the green light is because uh, uh, in uh, Italy, we are lucky, there are a, a lot of uh, scientists uh, that uh, are working on this, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, it, it's green, it's mostly green because we are acting a lot. Uh, I, I will say a few words because uh, from my point of view it's not, not all so green. Anyway, uh, in my presentation what I would like to uh, uh, introduce you is what the work I work with that has been done uh, just two years ago, it was exactly two years ago actually, in preparation uh, of the ministerial meeting, uh, health ministerial meeting uh, uh, of the G7. Uh, because in that meeting, uh, the Italian presidency uh, has tried to foster uh, uh, the adoption of a global strategy to reduce the effect of climate change in the global south. And it has been quite a challenge. But I, I think it, it's an interesting exercise that of the one that has been made because it has been, uh, perhaps for the first time, 
uh, at such high level meeting uh, the temperature to uh, introduce science into the discussion. Uh, this uh, uh, was the uh, uh, global strategy for action to reduce the effect of climate change, the global health uh, document that's been produced. But a few words about the approach, and uh, you can find also in, uh, uh, in a short uh, uh, paper uh, published by The Lancet, uh, uh, and uh, I think the title is, is quite uh, relevant. Can the scientific world positively influence uh, decision makers on planetary health? Because what we have tried to do, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, the former uh, chief medical officer of uh, uh, Italy, uh, Ranieri Guerra, that was also co-author of this article, and uh, we have tried to use this uh, uh, methodology. Uh, the first step, one year before the meeting, uh, uh, a big work that has been done inside uh, of the uh, health ministry uh, in uh, doing analysis of the evidence provided by the literature. Then all this evidence has been uh, uh, tried to uh, to be synthesized in a matrix that I will show you. This one, okay, right now. And uh, uh, so if I few columns, so starting from the exposure factor that come uh, from the climate change, try to define the health outcome uh, that could uh, happen, and a few expert statement on uh, action uh, of, uh, and then action related uh, uh, to uh, how uh, policy that can uh, uh, help uh, in uh, mitigate, but uh, uh, particularly in uh, adapt to uh, this uh, uh, factor of exposure. This matrix is quite a complex matrix. It, uh, it are more than 100 action. And of course, this is, although I think it's a very valuable because it's also you see uh, on the last column there are a lot of references. It's a very valuable uh, tool for uh, uh, a researcher. Uh, this uh, mostly unreadable for uh, a policymaker. So to the work that uh, we have done with the help of uh, uh, 200, more than 200 international experts, we interviewed 700 and we had answer from uh, 200 experts, is trying to prioritize all the action, all the uh, more than 100 action uh, that were uh, on that matrix. And this is, has been done both with an expert group that was, uh, 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 that met in Rome several times over the year uh, uh, and proposed by the G7 countries, and, but also using uh, the international expert with two rounds uh, that uh, of uh, Delphi uh, survey. And well, the results uh, are um, not so uh, surprising for those of you that uh, uh, know, uh, uh, you know the, this field. But uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it has been important that eventually the document that has been discussed at the G7 meeting, it has been uh, produced by the G7 expert and supported by uh, by dozen and dozen of uh, uh, international scientific experts. And uh, the the size that I've tried to do is to take the 20 action that has been uh, voted as uh, the most important action and proposed to, uh, uh, to the ministerial meeting uh, and try to uh, focus particularly on the first one and to see how is the situation in, in Italy and uh, particularly what it has been done in the last two years. Uh, as you can see, the situation is not so encouraging uh, since we have a lot of rats, some rats, a lot of oranges and very few green lights. Uh, I'll just take few because it will take too long just to go through all these uh, action that were encouraged to be taken by the, by the expert to, to the country. And uh, let's take the first one, promote policies on emission reduction uh, because these are action with co-benefits, we have heard that. 
and uh, improve air quality, enhancing energy security, reduced energy and water consumption in human Bahrain through greening cities and recycling water, and protection of ecosystem for carbon storage and other ecosystem services. Uh, the Lancet countdown report of this year uh, is quite clear about this. Uh, why a red light? You have already heard. Uh, Italy is particularly exposed to this, so it's a particularly relevant issue. Uh, we do not score, uh, in Italy we score uh, uh, particularly for uh, air pollution, uh, at, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we score first in the rank of the European, uh, uh, particularly European cities. And if you think of the number of times that uh, several uh, countries have passed what has been uh, uh, considered uh, the, the secure uh, air quality, uh, it, it's among us, particularly in the north part of Italy. And uh, the level of preparedness for me is a red because uh, a very little, too little has been done uh, also in the uh, last few years. And then uh, uh, if you scroll down, you see there are a, a lot of uh, other different uh, issues related uh, uh, on a completely different field. And this is, uh, uh, I think, quite uh, important, uh, and particularly for some of us that are working in public health uh, that are pushing the, uh, the uh, health in all policy uh, uh, view, uh, because uh, uh, there is little on uh, most of uh, these uh, uh, these subjects that uh, the health system by itself uh, can do. Most of the action uh, actually must be taken together with uh, uh, other sectors. Promote integrated health prevention for environment as well as climate action policies at city and community level by working with the relevant sector and stakeholders. Uh, again, uh, I think uh, the awareness, uh, the communication, uh, the awareness you raise, uh, the way of raising awareness and the communication, it, it's really important. Uh, why uh, orange and not red? Uh, there are people doing that, uh, we are here, but uh, uh, I think what it has been done so far is too far too little, far too little. And uh, uh, particularly the Friday movement uh, uh, are a good sign. The, the, uh, uh, particularly among the young people, I think this, uh, this is a subject that, that start to be uh, uh, one of the subjects important uh, for the population. But uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's just a start. And it, it's only it's just a start. Then uh, uh, it's only partially linked uh, to uh, climate change, but there are some evidence that uh, it could be linked also to climate change. The big issue of uh, antimicrobial resistance, and certainly uh, also in this one, Italy is uh, uh, scoring very badly. Uh, we have the higher number of uh, deaths uh, in Europe uh, uh, that can be connected with uh, the issue of antimicrobial uh, resistance. Then, uh, growing population nutrition, food security, health diets, is all the, the issue of nutrition. We have already heard uh, the, the alarm uh, uh, and uh, how climate change uh, also in Italy could uh, affect a lot, particularly in the southern part uh, of the country. Uh, promote and strengthen integrated surveillance. Uh, this uh, it's orange because uh, uh, we are probably facing, we will face uh, a, a lot of problem in Italy. Uh, we have seen that uh, how the vector-borne diseases can, can be can increase a lot. So it, it is a green light because certainly uh, our health system is uh, very capable uh, in terms of surveillance and in terms of first response. Uh, is the system prepared uh, to big numbers? This is a big question. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. And, uh, uh, and also this related with uh, uh, increased uh, uh, surveillance infectious disease and vector control uh, as a cross-cutting issue of public health uh, that uh, you'll find uh, uh, at, the very, at the end of, of my slide. 
uh, then th there is uh, another big issue uh, that uh, uh, certainly uh, is considered an issue in Italy, but I'm not so sure that uh, uh, it, the discussion so far has uh, catched the importance of uh, having a, a reasonable response uh, that uh, has, uh, it has not been quoted today. I think it is important how climate change could affect migration. And this is certainly uh, uh, in all the Mediterranean area, it's, uh, uh, it's something that we, we are seeing, but we will see much more. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, from health point of view, I think uh, the, the action of improving uh, the country of transit that can be Italy arrival, and again, uh, Italy is one of these health services, preferably culturally oriented, this is an, another big issue, immunization programs, drugs availability, make them uh, 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 easily accessible to migrants. I think it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, it's orange, it could be red, uh, but it's uh, orange because actually uh, there is a bit of awareness, there, is, uh, there are some good responses from our health system, uh, but st still, uh, uh, from my point of view, there is a lot to do. Uh, last but not the least is the One Health approach. So how the, 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 the health of animals and health, of the safety of food uh, is linked to human health. Is, I think it's a big issue and highly related, uh, as we heard, uh, to climate change. So uh, this is to, just to, to show you how uh, I think few lines uh, are already there and uh, how also uh, at uh, such high level meeting as a G7 health uh, ministerial meeting, uh, uh, these issues have been addressed uh, on the, perhaps that's something that uh, uh, Aldo will, uh, will tell you. There are documents that are be, that have been signed and are available uh, on the web. Still, uh, from my point of view, there is a lot to do uh, in terms of also a bit of research, because we are doing a lot of research on climate change, a lot of research on health, not too much research on how we can influence our policymakers uh, to uh, produce the differences that are so needed right now. And uh, this is one of the fields perhaps in which uh, uh, a bit more research should, uh, uh, should uh, uh, be uh, invested in and investigated. Uh, this is a, uh, perhaps a, a challenge that I'm throwing to, to the Lancet uh, uh, countdown uh, group. Uh, why not also having an indicator of about policies and, uh, uh, and also some of the best practices that are around the world, because very often these are uh, very, um, I do not see many countries that are doing a lot of policy, but there are at a much, much local level some uh, good, uh, uh, good examples. And I think uh, we should invest a lot in this. So my, my final message is uh, think, in terms of uh, how can we influence a uh, policymaker and have a policy that can really enhance uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, of a climate change effect for health. Move, we have to do something, we have to act, certainly. And uh, the big word is now, because we are already late. Thank you. is more a consideration or a comment rather than a question. But going back to the role of policy, the role of adaptation, in relation to health, and there are different agents, and adaptation can take place at different levels. 
And I just want to come back again to the example of air conditioning. Okay, that is a decision that has been made by an individual. That could be replaced with something else, which needs to take place at a higher level. So you need the, okay, thermal insulation, but that is a long-term investment, so you need policy, you need a um, favorable institutional setting. So I just wanted to maybe ask your vision about the role of uh, more kind of social forms of adaptation, even considering like changes in the working schedule or changes in the mode we work, like having the possibility to work from home when it's too hot or these kind of things. Yeah. I think that's probably uh, also something. And uh, regarding the role of policy, but also there is the issue of institutions, and which is sometimes a major um, obstacle to implement it. Policy. Uh, I think it, it's a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, it's all connected. That's that, that's that's the issue. Certainly, uh, if we want to have a, to make the change, so to be prepared, certainly we have to act at, at the state level local level at an individual level but the e individual will not move until uh, uh, there is a general awareness that we have to do something so that's why it is important to, do, to work at, at the different level to, to work at certainly a local level it's one of the most important because uh, uh, it's where the action can be taken and uh, the big differences that I mean uh, as you mentioned mentioned and now we are also facing urbanization as a big movement, but uh, so we have more people living in the city. And if the these cities are greener, we can they can have an incredible impact on all the issue we are discussing today. So certainly the local level is very important. But uh, uh, eventually, uh, the big difference and air conditioning is certainly a good example is. Uh, 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 individual behaviors. How we, can we affect the individual behaviors? Well, we, we, sh we should know that there are out of here some, some, something that are called social norms. And uh, the, quite often uh, the norms can influence the social norms, but that's why we need to study how this can happen. And uh, how, how this, uh, that's why I, I said perhaps we have now a bit to invest also on, uh, we, we need to have in, in our Lancet countdown uh, some uh, social policy uh, research because uh, uh, that's the need to, to, to be understood. Because it, it's not simply that you say, oh, oh now you have to, uh, to behave better, that people behave better. It's, it's not like that. It's not like that. And it's much more complex. And so I'll, I'll the public, the local uh, uh, action can influence eventually individual behavior. I think it's very, very relevant to be studied. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, absolutely agree. We need to start measuring action. Um, we see a lot of uh, kind of risk assessments happening investments, preparedness, uh, but actually to, to see the, the action or the, the effect, we're finding it really, really hard to actually measure that. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any idea on how we could actually get to measure it at a global le level, something that we actually can track. And as well as measuring it, um, identifying what the, the barriers are, where, the, where that step that we need to, to, to pass uh, lies and why we're not getting to the action because we're really not seeing much effect. Mainly because um, if you see no, out no outcome, it's very hard to influence um, the, the general public as well. Uh, you, you cannot really showcast any positive effect of your activities if you, if you don't have a, a measurable uh, outcome. So do you have any thoughts on how we could do it? I would love to have an indicator on, yeah. on action and outcomes. Uh, well, uh, could receive the Nobel Prize if I can answer yeah, let's in do that. Uh, 30 <laughs> seconds uh, your, your question. I'm working on that, but no, no uh, uh, my answer is we have to study. Certainly we have to study. And this is something that 
perhaps we can do together. With the new case studies as well. I'm really keen in in finding, uh, uh, I wouldn't say solution, but ways, uh, ways in in which uh, uh, the, uh, what is evident for, I wouldn't say most, 100% of the scientists can be evident also for public opinion and policy makers. There there should be strategies and these must be studied together. Yeah, we do, we try to approach those type of changes through case studies. So if you have any kind of ideas on a case study of some city in particular or country in particular where we find something interesting, it would be amazing. Okay, yeah. Let's keep in touch. (laughs) So let's move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Professor. It was brilliant. Thank you. To Aldo Di Benedetto from the Ministry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize, uh, uh, but my uh, English uh, is not good. Um, My presentation uh, uh, on the screen uh, is uh, in English. Uh, I'm going uh, uh, going to speak uh, in Italian. Capita spesso di eh, parlare a studenti universitari perché eh, questo argomento è un argomento complesso, è un argomento che richiede un approccio diverso da, da quello che eh, fa parte della nostra impostazione metodologica. E vorrei eh, introdurre due concetti che non sono stati diciamo, sufficientemente affrontati nei corsi di studio, ma nemmeno per quanto riguarda l'argomento climate change. Perché eh, omeostasi? Qui ci, ci sono alcune definizioni che io tratto da eh, un autore poco noto, si chiama Aldo Sacchetti, è un medico di sanità pubblica che 30 anni fa, anche di più, ha scritto le cose che oggi sono le più diffuse. Le ha scritte in questo libro che si chiama Scienza e Coscienza, pubblicato nel 2000, e eh, ha anticipato un po' eh, gli scenari che noi stiamo ci stiamo raccontando, stiamo studiando. E, eh, vi lascio a voi la lettura di queste definizioni perché sono molto accurate, molto puntuali e eh, mi soffermo sull'ultima, tutto ciò che interagisce con un essere vivente comporta necessariamente un'attività di riequilibrio omeostatico. Certamente dobbiamo parlare anche di omeostasi della biosfera perché eh, le forze vitali a cui si fa riferimento che sono le forze vitali che hanno conformato la nostra biosfera non esistono negli altri pianeti. Questa è la chiave di lettura. Sono forze vitali che hanno trasformato un'atmosfera con dei gradienti di tossicità elevata, attualmente presenti negli altri pianeti, in gradienti 
consentiti per la vita. Quindi la vita esiste in quanto ci sono delle condizioni per cui possa esistere. Basta misurare la temperatura nella superficie di Marte e potete notare che c'è una differenza, c'è un gradiente tra il giorno e la notte di oltre 80 gradi, si va dai 150 di giorno ai meno 80 di notte, più o meno, se non vado errato. La temperatura invece della Terra è regolata da un meccanismo omeostatico, quindi c'è un equilibrio che permea tutto il nostro sistema vivente che si chiama biosfera. Quindi vorrei sottolineare questo aspetto, spesso non sottolineato, l'attenzione deve essere posta non tanto sulla termicità, sull'aumento della temperatura, quanto su tutto ciò che comporta l'instabilità degli equilibri che si sono consolidati nel corso degli anni. E ricordo che recentemente l'ultimo rapporto IPPC ha puntualizzato alcuni aspetti che riguardano la regolazione omeostatica della temperatura che passa attraverso non solo una efficiente gestione delle risorse, soprattutto attraverso una efficiente gestione degli ecosistemi. Quindi il messaggio è, è stato quello di vogliamo aumentare le super, la superficie verde, quindi aumentare le foreste. No? E questo argomento eh, è un argomento di sanità pubblica? Ce lo dice l'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità, conferenza di Ostrao, è una conferenza gestita dai ministri dell'ambiente e della salute di 53 stati della, Unione, della Regione Europea dell'OMS che eh, nel giugno del 2017 hanno stabilito questi indirizzi puntando l'attenzione tra gli altri, rischio chimico, fisico, cambiamenti climatici. C'è quindi da parte dell'OMS un'attenzione molto, molto particolare su questo argomento. Il G7 l'ha ricordato il professor Campostrini, per la prima volta in Italia si è voluto discutere in un contesto istituzionale come quello del G7 e non vi nascondo la difficoltà che c'è stata nella discussione con gli altri paesi perché abbiamo introdotto un argomento trasversale e i nostri interlocutori che si interessavano a volte di agricoltura, a volte di salute, a volte di ambiente non riuscivano a capire il senso di questa proposta. Alla fine della discussione siamo riusciti a farglielo capire l'importanza di mettere insieme tante argomentazioni che riguardano la biosfera, che riguardano la salute. Quindi eh, dobbiamo mettere insieme, lavorare insieme, questo era il messaggio. Ho ricordato all'inizio del mio intervento l'università. Recentemente sono stato chiamato eh, presso l'Università di Milano dove c'erano 100 medici di sanità pubblica che volevano discutere dei temi di frontiera della sanità pubblica. E uno di questi temi di frontiera è stato individuato, il climate change. Il Ministero della Salute, oltre a, al G7, 
qualche anno fa, sempre come supporto di questa iniziativa, ha messo in atto un progetto, questo è il tema del progetto, effetti dei cambiamenti climatici sulla salute umana nella Planetary Health Vision. Questo è il taglio del progetto, un progetto che eh, ha coinvolto 12 unità operative appartenenti a diverse università, diversi enti, diverse istituzioni, in forma trasversale, come ricordavo prima, compresa l'OMS e eh, qui c'è l'elenco delle eh, 12 eh, istituzioni che hanno compartecipato al progetto e come eh, obiettivo finale del progetto è stato proposto un country profile Italy sul, sul clima eh, per chi non lo conoscesse il country profile è un'iniziativa che è stata adottata dall'OMS assieme al UNFPC, che è l'organizzazione ONU che si occupa dei cambiamenti climatici, e lo scopo del eh, country profile, gli scopi sono questi qui elencati, quindi sensibilizzare l'opinione pubblica, sostenere il processo decisionale basato sull'evidenza per rafforzare la resilienza climatica, promuovere azioni che migliorano la salute responsabilizzare i ministri della salute e gli altri decisori a impegnarsi. No? Questa è eh, diciamo, la copertina del Country Profile Italy, prodotta nell'ambito del progetto a cui facevo riferimento. Con me ho portato delle copie, per chi le volesse, eh, comunque è pubblicato sul sito dell'OMS. Qui ci sono diciamo, dei riferimenti a cui io non, su cui io non, non mi soffermo, però ecco, quello che eh, vorrei precisare in questa sede è che l'Italia eh, può essere eh, un vero e proprio laboratorio per quanto riguarda lo studio dei cambiamenti climatici, in particolare per la sua posizione geografica al centro del Mediterraneo e in quanto una penisola. Quindi eh, ci sono tutte le condizioni per eh, monitorare, per registrare cambiamenti eh, nel clima, ma non solo, eh, e impatti a diversi livelli, ma questo è stato già detto nelle precedenti relazioni, di cui non mi soffermo. Ovviamente anche il eh, Centro Euro Mediterraneo per i cambiamenti climatici ha partecipato diciamo, attivamente alla realizzazione di questo progetto, lo devo qui ricordare. Le tabelle eh, sono, diciamo, eh, raccontano un po' quello che è l'impatto eh, del clima per quanto riguarda gli effetti sulla salute. Eh, qui c'è diciamo, illustrato un po' quello che comporta diciamo, la mortalità eh, dovuta alle ondate di calore. sull'inquinamento dell'aria non mi soffermo sui singoli argomenti per, per motivi diciamo di non, per non ripetere un po' le cose già dette e sulla sicurezza sugli ecosistemi e, e qui vorrei soffermarmi un attimo perché eh, un gruppo di lavoro dell'Università La Sapienza ehm, ha proposto eh, un aspetto diciamo, che spesso non viene considerato, ma è quello dell'importanza eh, dell delle infrastrutture verdi, quindi eh, nel, nel concetto di urban health inserire questo aspetto che è importante eh, in quanto può uh, alleggerire l'impatto soprattutto per quanto riguarda eh, i pollini, eh, per quanto riguarda eh, le ondate di calore eh, e soprattutto per eh, evitare eh, quello che eh, può comportare 
un peggioramento delle condizioni soprattutto del, dei cittadini che vivono in condizioni precarie nelle grandi città. Ecco, eh, qui ci sono le risposte che lo Stato italiano diciamo, sta dando per quanto riguarda gli aspetti legati ai cambiamenti climatici. E due sono uh, le questioni diciamo, su cui io, uh, vorrei eh, che io vorrei sottolineare. Una di queste è, mh, è quella della uh, strategia di adattamento ai cambiamenti climatici, che è un documento elaborato dal Ministero dell'Ambiente, eh, assieme ovviamente agli altri ministeri e l'altro è quello del piano di adattamento ai cambiamenti climatici eh, il CMCC anche in questo caso sta lavorando per, eh, per quanto riguarda questo aspetto e, la migliore strategia eh, io qui L'ho sintetizzata, è un lavoro che, che ho fatto insieme con uh, il, il dottor Ranieri Guerra, con cui ho collaborato nella fase diciamo, del G7 Salute, eh, ma voi eh, potete notare che eh, si parla di lavoro in equip, eh, di sorveglianza, eh, di eh, ridurre la vulnerabilità. Eh, e il supporto politico e la disponibilità di risorse economiche adeguate sulle condizioni economiche rilevanti. Collaborazione e comunicazione internazionale. È una flowchart questa che riassume un po' eh, i concetti che sono stati più volte ripetuti nel corso degli interventi. Approccio basato sulle migliori conoscenze, metodi per l'analisi dei sistemi complessi, promuovere consapevolezza collettiva e ovviamente eh, questi sono diciamo, uh, un po' aspetti sintetici che andrebbero diciamo, elaborati di volta in volta. Eh, L'edizione italiana delle scienze ha pubblicato recentemente questo diciamo, rapporto, è un po' il rapporto del Country Profile Italia, tradotto diciamo, in forma divulgativa. E anche l'Istituto Superiore di Sanità ha eh, realizzato nel 2018 un uh, grande consensus internazionale. E, con la partecipazione di 500 ricercatori, alla fine del quale è stata eh, redatta una cosiddetta carta di Roma eh, con questo slogan, al giro sul clima per difendere la salute dei cittadini. Anche questo è pubblicato sul, sul, su internet, quindi sul sito dell'Istituto dell Superiore di Sanità. Eh, concludo questo mio intervento soffermandomi su... Eh, gli aspetti che a mio parere sono oh, quelli dirimenti, eh, sono le chiavi diciamo, di lettura che possono modificare eh, il nostro approccio, eh, ma soprattutto oh, la comprensibilità dell'argomento. Eh, io ritengo che eh, ecco, la scienza abbia un ruolo rilevante perché eh, si lavora in forma separata, questo è l'aspetto la, uh, diciamo, più critico. Eh, lavorare in equip significa mettere insieme le conoscenze, ma non, non soltanto uh, avere eh, dei pareri, confrontare i pareri e trasformare questi pareri in informazioni che possono essere diciamo, comprensibili e leggibili alla popolazione. E non è una cosa da poco. E 
cosa pensava ieri la pubblica opinione rispetto ai cambiamenti climatici? C'era scarsa attenzione, c'era scarsa consapevolezza e c'era disinteresse, fino a qualche anno fa. Cosa pensa oggi? Ora, che cosa è successo in questo frangente? Forse non tutti ci, ce lo siamo chiesto, ma qualcosa è accaduto. E questa è una rivolta degli studenti, e questa è una crescita di sensibilità improvvisa. Qualcuno ha capito di più rispetto a prima. Secondo me è questa la chiave di lettura. System thinking. Bisogna cambiare il modo di pensare. Quindi il sistema è il nostro modo di pensare e interpretare la realtà. Invece il nostro modo di pensare e interpretare la realtà è oggi è in maniera separata. No? Quindi non mettiamo insieme le cose. Ho fatto un po' di comunicazione in vita mia, voi mi scuserete ma penso che sia molto più utile utilizzare questi messaggi. Laudato sì, ora guardate cosa c'è scritto in questa enciclica di, di Papa Francesco. Il concetto è quello che ho espresso, non lo ripeto. Questo è questo. Shakespeare, Amleto. La visione sistemica della salute. E vi lascio con questo messaggio. Grazie. Bella domanda questa. Eh, io posso dire delle esperienze che ci sono state, perché il, il primo a coniare il termine fu Lorenz, ma parliamo dei primi del Novecento. Eh, dopodiché eh, c'è stato uno sviluppo eh, piuttosto diciamo, accelerato legato dicia, diciamo, alla al positivismo, al neopositivismo della scienza no? ma ci, nel frattempo ci sono state altre esperienze come per esempio il pensatore di Santa Fe eh, dove negli anni 80 nel decennio degli anni 80 un gruppo di, di ricercatori di scienziati appartenenti a molte discipline sono tutti premi Nobel si sono riuniti per discutere di aspetti legati alla complessità. Quindi la complessità è il clima, la complessità è la società, la complessità è diciamo, la nostra vita eh, e richiede un approccio, un approccio sistemico. 
Approccio sistemico non significa mettere insieme i pezzi. Approccio sistemico significa pensare in forma eh, contaminata, ossia contaminare e farsi contaminare. No? Uso un termine, diciamo, brutale per essere più chiaro. No? Quindi, e, e questo significa anche eh, strutturare eh, le metodologie e i corsi di studio in maniera tale che avvenga questa contaminazione. Facciamo sistema. Oggi si usa molto spesso questo termine. Non significa niente. Non si fa sistema. Si pensa in maniera sistemica. Ossia noi siamo separati e ci mettiamo insieme. Questo significa che facciamo sistema. Ma non è così. No? <ride> Quindi eh, la risposta che, che le posso fare eh, gliela farei volentieri facendo diciamo, una, una, così, un seminario sulla complessità e su, sul pensiero sistemico. Eh, lo, lo dico perché insomma, ho dedicato grossa parte della mia eh, ricerca metodologica e scientifica degli ultimi dieci anni a questo aspetto. Ma è necessario diciamo, approfondire l'argomento, partire da ciò che sappiamo, da, dalle esperienze fatte e poi eh, cercare di eh, intraprendere eh, questo percorso dentro le aule universitarie, dentro le strutture preesistenti e eh, lasciarsi condizionare. Non posso dire altro. Tante grazie. Eh, posso intentare parlare l'italiano, ma il mio italiano non è tanto buono, quindi se non mi capisce chiedo al Puno di tradurre. Ehm, sono d'accordo, abbiamo sbagliato il messaggio, perché da tanti anni ne abbiamo parlato dei cambiamenti climatici come un problema della natura e non nostro. Penso che adesso eh, capiamo un po' di più eh, gli effetti sulla sanità dei cambiamenti climatici e magari per, per quello eh, c'è un movimento che adesso un po' più preoccupato per la nostra casa, eh, cosa faranno i nostri bambini in futuro. Ma eh, hai parlato tanto di mettere insieme questi diversi gruppi o modi da, da pensare. E volevo chiederti, pensi che in molti paesi ne abbiamo un ministero della sanità e un ministero dell'ambiente, è, è tanto difficile farli parlare tra di loro. Pensi che questa struttura funziona o che mancherebbe una, un nuovo ministero tipo dei cambiamenti climatici che, che davvero possa mettere insieme eh, la salute e eh, l'ambiente e tutto è più, più comprensivo? Allora, io rispondo a quello che eh, ho pensato tanti anni fa e che era diciamo, una, la mia visione. La mia visione è quella che non, non, non c'è una separazione tra ambiente e salute, ossia il Ministero dell'Ambiente e il Ministero della Salute sono due accezioni burocratiche, dovrebbero stare insieme, per tanti motivi, soprattutto perché l'ambiente non, non significa niente, casomai la salute dell'ambiente, non l'ambiente, l'ambiente è una cosa asettica, è una cosa fisica, ma non interessa. Non interessa a nessuno, quello che interessa alle persone è star bene in un contesto che si chiama ambiente e star bene in salute. No? Quindi ritorno al messaggio che va cambiato, altrimenti non, la popolazione non capisce. No? Quindi, eh, per quanto riguarda invece eh, gli aspetti legati a cambiamenti climatici, secondo il mio parere dovrebbe essere il governo, quindi la presidenza del Consiglio dei Ministri a, a porre l'argomento all'attenzione eh, della politica, all'attenzione della società. No? Affidare al Ministero dell'Ambiente un argomento così rilevante significa metterlo in secondo piano e in effetti è in secondo piano.
Grazie per questo ricordo che viviamo in un sistema complesso e che coevolve insieme, quindi tutto, è collega, tutto si collega con tutto. E chiaramente noi con il nostro metodo razionale aristotelico abbiamo diviso in tante discipline ed ora non siamo in grado di travalicarle. Quindi facciamo l'interdisciplinarità ma non facciamo la transdisciplinarità. Come fare? Da dove cominciare? Io credo che dobbiamo partire dalla meraviglia e dalla compassione. Quello che ci dice il Papa nella sua enciclica. Cioè celebriamo il creato, celebriamo quello che funziona se vogliamo ripartire con una nuova scienza e una nuova tecnologia che, sia, che metta al primo posto l'uomo e la compassione. A mio parere, non lo dico per fare una battuta, l'enciclica prodotta da Papa Francesco, che è pubblicata, è un documento scientifico, l'avrebbe dovuto fare una università quel documento, un'accademia, casomai uno Stato, una istituzione, l'ha fatto la Chiesa, sulla spinta di Papa Francesco che adesso sta andando avanti, perché sappiamo che c'è un investimento, c'è stato un investimento notevole no? per quanto riguarda il Sud America e, e quant'altro, Amazzonia, eccetera. E, cioè, Papa Francesco ha capito tutto, secondo me, ha capito qual è il vero problema no? e sta investendo... Eh, divingolandosi tra una miriade di difficoltà ma lo sta facendo quindi eh, credo che eh, sia un ottimo interlocutore per le istituzioni politiche no? sociali e scientifiche Velocemente, io penso che manca la creatività nella comunicazione, che veramente siamo troppo divisi. Il mondo eh, il scientifico e il mondo della gente, della gente comune, è completamente distante uno dall'altro. E solo chi appartiene a, a gruppi privilegiati, a quelli che hanno studiato, che sanno di queste cose. Perciò io penso che bisognerebbe un po' agire sulla connessione delle per eh, esempio io sono un artista e, interessante <ride> ecco, e noi artisti veramente parliamo per conto nostro e abbiamo il nostro mondo attorno che ci gira ma non siamo collegati siamo veramente come un, mostro, come un mondo a parte e questo è anche storico perché in passato attraverso l'arte, ecco, guardiamo Venezia, questo è prodotto della cultura e dell'arte. E tutto quello che è stato costruito fino adesso, bello, è prodotto della cultura e dell'arte. E adesso non ci sono più, quello che hai detto prima, eh, hai detto tu, non ci sono più questi collegamenti. Grazie. E guardi che eh, ci sono diversi scienziati che hanno, che hanno cercato di coniugare questi aspetti, arte e scienza. Eh, ne ricordo uno, poco noto, poco conosciuto, e no, non capisco ancora perché non è inserito nei corsi di studio universitari, Ilia Prigogin. Ilia Prigogin è stato un grande scienziato che ha eh, lavorato sulla, sulla termodinamica del non equilibrio, si chiama così, ma che è un, un, un argomento che studia diciamo, le emergenze, le emergenze diciamo, a tutti i livelli, comprese le emergenze climatiche, no? quindi è il presupposto. Ma uno degli argomenti eh, più eh, diciamo, a cuore di Ilia Prigogin, perché lo racconta lui nella sua bibli bibliografia, biografia, che non avrebbe voluto fare lo scienziato ma voleva fare l'umanista no? perché era la cosa che gli interessava di più e eh, 
ha scritto un libro meraviglioso che si chiama eh, La nuova alleanza tra natura e uomo. No? E eh, in questo libro evoca molti artisti no? che fanno parte della cultura letteraria no? dello scorso secolo. E eh, ricorda come eh, questi artisti interpretano la loro oh, vita sociale, eh, le loro epoche, e ne danno un taglio descrittivo comprensibile, no? che è quello più collegato alla realtà, mentre la scienza si è ancora di più allontanata da quella che era la propria origine. No? Quindi eh, è ancora collegata a un presupposto che è eh, il presupposto, diciamo, illuminista, no? Quindi, il eh, presupposto illuministico non è eh, artistico, è un presupposto diciamo, positivistico, è un presupposto materialistico. No? Quindi c'è questo bisogno di recuperare diciamo, eh, la visione eh, artistica della vita, creativa della vita. No? Perché comunque noi eh, nel momento in cui ci approcciamo, nel momento in cui noi eh, dialoghiamo, ci confrontiamo, eh, proponiamo oh, la nostra visione, no? quindi eh, non proponiamo una visione asettica, una visione diciamo, descrittiva fatta al computer. No, we have to, we have to stop, sorry. Grazie mille. But... È, un argomento, è un argomento, lo so, questo è un argomento che, che non, finis, non finirebbe mai, che, coinvolge eh, tantissimo, però ecco, bisogna, eh, secondo me bisogna eh, affrontarlo, quindi bisogna che si parli molto di più di questo e molto di meno di, di tecniche che sono diciamo, poco comprensibili. Grazie. So with that we come to close, but before we do I'd like to thank Marina for making the trek to more civilized non-Brexit world for the presentation, but I'd also like to thank Professor Compostrini and Dr. Aldo Di Benedetto for their speeches. Thank you for all the questions. There were, I think we had a very interactive, interactive sessions with the questions and the comments, and let's, let's do this again very soon. And also thanks to all those uh, who made this possible. Erico Costa and his team from Cafoscari, Mauro Bonacore, Alessandro Mazzai from CMCC, thank you very much. And uh, again, enjoy the Pontef to the Venetians and uh, grazie mille e forza Venezia. <laughs>